To the authorities, these rowdy gatherings spelt trouble. But the pull of a prize fight was hard to control. They'd spring up at fairgrounds or race meetings, where anyone could get up and try their hand in the ring. It was on such an occasion in 1796 that Bill Richmond entered the records of boxing history. Bill's first display in the pugilistic art was with one George Moore, better known by the name of Docky, who insulted Bill upon the course at York during the time of the races. This Docky had been the terror of Sheffield and had ruled the roost for some time in that part of the country. Come on, I have you. Bill's friends advised him from attempting to fight such a man, Bill weighing only 10 stone 12 pounds, but he was not to be deterred. And in the course of some 20 minutes, our hero punished Docky so completely that he gave in and was taken away, totally blind. What the heck? To understand what an 18th century prize fight was like, I think you've got to deliberately shed all the images you've got of modern boxing. Here was a contest which was a mixture between um, boxing and wrestling. There were throws as well as blows. Basically, it was decided by the umpires at the moment uh, what was allowed. And quite often, this would depend upon who the crowd was running for. It was a very, very bloodthirsty business out there. They were allowed to kick. The favourite target was the kidneys. Quite often delivered with a blow called the chopper. Another way of stopping a fight very, very quickly. You had to be made of pretty stern stuff to stand in this ring and knowing you could be there for two hours. Throws, I mean, imagine being thrown over, over the shoulder and landing on your head. Knuckling the eyes, headbutting. Bill Richmond's victory over Docky Moore was no fluke. He soon earned a reputation on the local boxing scene. But his only reward was a handful of coppers collected from the race-goers. What every sportsman in England in the 18th century wanted was a patron. Men with money. If you could get noticed by one of the patrons and take some of their money off them, that was really your ideal. It's like having a sponsor in the modern world. It opened doors socially. It provided money and security in a world that, that didn't really have any guarantees on either. Bill's exploits on the fringes of the boxing world soon got him spotted by one of the prize ring's most well-connected backers, Lord Camelford. London beckoned. Camelford was the classic upper-class playboy. He was a wayward cousin of the Prime Minister, with a taste for riotous living. Lord Camelford had this um, reputation for dressing down, for living low, which was really quite popular in that age, where gentlemen, by putting on the clothes of a lower social class, you could pretend to be one of them. You could go to the sleaziest of taverns and do the most disreputable things, and he'd get away with it. He lived in this twilight world between the down and outs and the lordly moneyed class. Camelford was a man of many vices, and at the top of his list came gambling. There had been a revolution in France, there were revolutions all over Europe, and people were terrified. They thought that there was going to be one in England. If you inherited a large fortune, you might not live to spend it, so why not gamble with it? And so they did. People were beginning to be a bit embarrassed about bear baiting and cockfighting. So they were looking for something else violent to bet on. The violent thing they found then was pugilism. 
Lord Camelford introduced Bill to the High Temple of the Boxing World, the Fives Court on St. Martin's Lane. Gentlemen flocked there to soak up the atmosphere and rub shoulders with London's elite community of prize fighters. Bill liked what he saw, but to chance his arm in the prize ring's top flight would be a prospect fraught with danger. You could easily disfigure your hands if you were unlucky in the ring. Therefore, you could not go back to the only craft you had, which was cabinet making, which is all about manual dexterity. And to hang up his cabinet maker's tools and to go into boxing was an enormous risk. But he would have had to have a lot of self-belief, you know, and an enormous amount of ambition, you know, to, to seize this opportunity and to, and to say to himself, look, I could either make it now or I'll be poor all my life. All through the year of 1800, Bill prepared for his professional debut. With his livelihood as a craftsman in the balance and Camelford's cash riding on the outcome, failure was not an option. Richmond's first public set to in London was in Blackheath with a whip maker by the name of Green. A purse of ten guineas was made up on the spur of the moment after a dinner in Bob's chop house. The battle raged with fury for some time, but the man of colour got the whip hand of green in such style that after ten minutes he cried out, Enough! The fact that Bill could not just box, but batter and beat to a pulp white people in Britain tells you about the, the kind of paradoxical nature of, of not just the British character, but British society. Britain dominates the slave trade, and at the same time it allows you space for self-expression and self-betterment. So people like Bill are able to move up because of their individual skill and talent. Bill and his patron made the perfect team. Camelford's cash did the walking, and Bill's fists did the talking. And while Bill bashed his way up the ranks of the London prize fighting scene, Camelford sat back and counted his winnings. By the spring of 1805, the Black Terror was ready to take on the best. Richmond is conspicuous in his gaiety. He's full of milling some tremendous faces from Richmond. And the Jew concedes he can take no more. was relatively small, often fighting men of much greater weight. There were no weight divisions. Richmond would have been forced to, to move around a lot more, switching, shifting, trying to traverse or go to the side of the man, try and draw the man forward so he could hit on the counter. By moving constantly backwards, what you did was make the man step forward. In much the same way as Muhammad Ali, some people thought he, he shifted too much, i.e. cowardice thing, but in fact he was being sensible, moving away from a bigger man and moving in when it, when it was safe to do so. By rights, Bill was too small to take on the largest fighters, but his unique style floored all comers. And by the autumn of 1805, the Black Terror was judged to be one of England's best pugilists. Richmond could make a hundred guineas in one night. A lot of money in, in, in that time. And uh, so boxing, his fists, his brawn, uh, uh, got him to where he was, which is a terrific statement about how he overcame slavery. Because in the slave period, black people were defined according to their physiques. They were just valued for their physique. You know, they were just muscle with a cutlass at the end of the muscle and a lot of cane or cotton at the end of that cutlass. So Richmond used this physique, the thing that defined him as a slave, to acquire national prominence. Bill's sights were now set on the championship of the prize ring. But one man stood in his path. 